deeply moved by it. It was just the feeling for Robert Jordan's work, for the Wheel of Time, that I would love to see in the person who was going to finish it. And uh, Jim, which was his real name, and I, I tried once or twice to talk to him about what, who might be suitable when, if the worst came to the worst, and it was perfectly obvious he didn't want to talk about that. So, so we didn't. Um, and I didn't really have any hot shot ideas who on earth could possibly do it anyway. But I thought about this eulogy, and I called Tom Doherty, and, and some of you, I'm sure, know I was the original editorial director of TOR. So I worked with um, Tom Doherty for all of these 40 years. Um, and so Tom told me about Brandon Sanderson. And Tom is a publisher, not an editor. So here's what he said. He said, well, say no on the land trust for this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give me numbers. He said, okay, I'll send you Mistborn to read. And I received a copy of Mistborn, and I read uh, 47 pages, I think it was, and I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that some other editors have the same weird uh, reaction that I do. I can't fall asleep until I know the story is in good hands. If the story is lousy, I have to stay awake until I've figured out how to fix it. Or it across the room because it's beyond help. But this was good. And when I woke up, the world, the characters, the conflict, even what people ate, it was all clear. And I said, this guy can do it. So I'm talking to Tom and I tell him that. And he says, did you, you read the whole book this fast? because he's also worked with me for 40 years. He said, I said, well, no. <laughs> he said, this is a very important decision. Don't you think you should read the whole book? And I said, well, if I were hiring him to write a Brandon Sanderson novel, yes, but I'm not. I'm hiring him to write a Robert Jordan novel. And so, and he said, well, okay, if you really think so. And um, I did take advice from an editor in New York who I trust, and I also spoke to Orbit in London, because the Brits had been very successful with Robert Jordan. I thought, who knows, they may have some secret wizard. <laughs> and kind of thought about it and brooded, and then made the call to Brandon. But not before. Um, I thought, Polo, Utah has to be about as big <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> um, I just called up Provo Information and said, a number for Brandon Sanderson, please, and they gave it to me. And I called and got a woman and I said, hello, is this Mrs. Sanderson? And she said, yes, it is. And I said, well, I'm, a, no, no, no. I'm calling um, about the Wheel of Time to see whether your husband would be interested in completing the series. And she said, I haven't a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it was thus that I began to understand that Provo, Utah includes two brands. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I thought to my own stupidity. Two brands, of course. And um, so we got this voicemail. And I sat there stunned, right? This is the first thing I did in the morning is I checked my voicemail. Um, I used to be much better at that than I am now. <laughs> um, and so I checked my voicemail, and then I just stared at the phone. <laughs> and then I called back the number that Mary had left, uh, but she wasn't in. Uh, she had gone out to get a massage. Um, and so I, I got her voicemail. Um, and then so I called uh, my editor, who didn't answer. Uh, he never answers though. I love you, Moshe, but he never answers. Um, and so I called my agent, and he always answers, but he didn't answer. Uh, so I, I wandered upstairs um, to my wife, who was uh, doing something in the bedroom, you know, clothes or something. And I, I looked at her and I said, Robert Jordan's widow just called me. And she said, what? What did she want? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, and was 
said, well, call the publisher. I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, so I, I called up Tor. I got a hold of Patrick Nielsen Hayden there. Um, and Patrick, I, I said, Patrick, Robert Jordan's widow just called me. He's one of the editors there. And Patrick, um, he says, oh, yeah, that's probably what you think it is. Um, I'll never call you back. <laughs> like, Patrick, what do I think it is? He wouldn't have, he wouldn't say that. Um, and so I finally, I, I, I get a hold of um, Harry. Well, she calls me back. Um, and, you know, after me sitting and staring at the phone for 30 minutes or whatever. Um, and she says, well, I was wondering if you would be interested in finishing The Wheel of Time. And yeah. we're compiling a short list. Yeah. I didn't tell him how short. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Combining the short list, we want to know if you would be in it, interested um, you know, in being on it. Um, and I replied, <laughs> I say that jokingly. Um, I'm sorry if you've heard this story before, but I really couldn't get anything out. Um, to the point that I had to write Harriet an email the next day, um, which I said, Dear Harriet, I promise I'm not an idiot. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, um, I did say yes. And then I spent a month sweating as she, I wondered who else was on the list. Um, <laughs> and after a month, um, Harriet called me back and said, I, I made my decision. Um, I would like you to do it. You're interested still. Um, and by then, and I, I'd written her an email about this too, I had decided I really was interested. Um, even though um, I didn't feel anyone could finish the series the right way, um, I wanted to be the one who was there trying. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to be in my hands if Robert Jordan couldn't do it. It's kind of that, you know. Yeah, it, I don't didn't know if I could trust anyone else, sort of thing. Um, and and so I said yes, and I, I flew to Charleston. Within just a couple of weeks, we had contracts on. Um, Jason from Dragon Knot was already having me for an interview, um, and um, Jason's a good friend now. He uh, he doesn't deserve to be called. Say he hounded me, but he hounded me. Um, that's what he does. That's what he does. He's very good at that. In the nicest way possible. Um, he makes you feel guilty about it. Yeah. Um, and so I, at that point, got the notes. The notes, guys. Um, I hadn't known beforehand, and I apologize, I'm sucking in a lozenge because my voice, if you can't tell, it's, it's been through a lot these last few weeks on tour. Um, I, I didn't know how much there was. I didn't know what had been done on the book. Um, I, I, you know, I, I had to sign all the contracts first, um, and, as was right. And so I went into this knowing only that he had written the ending. Um, that was the only thing I knew. Um, I didn't know if we'd ever find out, you know, who killed Asmodi, and I didn't know any of this stuff. I only knew that there was an ending. Um, and so I got handed the notes, and the notes are awesome. But the notes are chaos, um, because the notes were built by Robert Jordan for Robert Jordan. Um, and um, a few weeks ago, I tried to combine these all into one document. Some of you may have seen me do that on Twitter, to tweet about this. I put them all into one document um, and um, let Microsoft, then told Microsoft Word to uh, count this all, because it's like 200 different files or something like that. It actually took me like an hour going through and saying, add this one, add this one, add this one. OK, now count them. Um, and at 32,000 pages, it said, I can't count any more pages. Um, that's, someone told me that's like a number in computers, 32,200 and something or whatever. They have to sign a certain number of bits or whatever to count for how, only how long many pages the document was. And they thought, no, no one needs a document longer than 32,000 pages, uh, which they probably shouldn't ever need a document longer than 32,000 pages. The entire wheel of time is uh, 10,000 pages. Um, and so it was around five million words, and then uh, I said, I can't count anymore, and then my computer crashed. <laughs> um, so I was handed that, um, with a pat on the, on the back and a, and a hearty good luck. Um, <laughs> but fortunately, um, Marie and Alan, uh, Robert Jordan's assistants, had already been working on this, and they knew that those 32,000 pages um, were, were nigh into impenetrable. Uh, to mere mortals like myself. Um, and they had begun working on 
uh, gathering out of all of those notes the things that were specific to book 12, as we thought it was at that time, the last book. Um, because um, in those notes are a lot of notes for books that are already written. Um, in fact, you'll read them, it'll be like a big glossary of, of terms for like book five or things like this. And then there'll be one for book six that includes all the ones from book five plus the ones that were added in book five. And then there'll be one for book seven that'll have all of that plus some stuff for book six. And then they'll skip like book eight. And then there'll be like ones for book two. Um, you know, um, and it's just, it's all over the place, but it's full and it's, it repeats itself a ton because he wanted to, you know, he'll have like a file for a person's name and he'll say, remember this. This is how, uh, here, here's one from it. This is how, um, this is how Semiraj regards, um, regards Shadar Haran, right? That's in there 12 times because it's under like her, it's under Shadar Haran, it's under the, the Forsaken list, it's under things to remember for book 12, it's um, under the scene um, that he was planning where Semiraj um, is influenced by him. This is cutting in and out. Do we have a better mic or um, is something going on here? Are we okay? Um, we're going to fix it, okay. Um, I'll try this one for a little bit. Um, but it, So it's there like 12 times. It's all over the place. Um, and they had begun gathering up the things I specifically needed for book 12, and they had kindly printed this all out in 200 pages for me. <laughs> uh, 200 pages of information, which was um, a lot of um, uh, scenes that he'd worked on before passing away. Um, this included what is now the epilogue to a memory of light. You guys are, are holding it, or it's probably at your feet or, or something, but you've got the book. You've got what I then looked through. Um, what, what the bulk of that was um, a prologue and an ending. Uh, there were touchstone scenes in between, uh, a place where Egwene gets a special visitor um, in Gathering Storm, um, and they discuss, um, they discuss the colors of dresses. Um, a place where, uh, where, where Matt um, visits a, a specific place we've been waiting for him to visit for a long, long time. Yeah, um, we, he did that. Um, you know, there, there's, there were scenes in there, but most of the bulk of what he'd written was prologue and, um, and what became the epilogue. Um, and in there also were just lists, Q and A's, tons of Q and A's with his assistants um, during his, his last months when they'd said, tell us what happens to this character. Oh, this character, you know, this. Well, you said this, what does that mean? Well, it means I'm either going to do this or this or something else. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what does this mean, this, this phrase you used? Well, it means this. Um, what, what is the blank in the blank? Um, they, um, the thing that uh, he talked to Wilson about, and he talked about that and things. And this was all given to me, and over the course of the next five years, I turned it into the book, which you now hold as three. Um, <laughs> but which is still kind of one book to me. Um, and that's, that's been the process. I am really happy that you guys have it now, partially because I can start talking about it. Uh, I got to read this ending five years ago and I didn't be able to couldn't talk to anyone about it, uh, except for Team Jordan. Um, I'm also very, very happy that the Wheel of Time was able to touch so many of us and the, the opportunity I've had to be part of it. It's, it's really just been amazing. The, the most common question I get uh, from people is, what does it feel like, or what did it feel like to work on this? And as a writer, being able to, number one, um, in a lot of ways, like step up to the master and kind of lend my shoulder um, for, you know, the last crossing, um, feels like just an incredible honor. Um, I got to be the journeyman writer who stepped into Robert Jordan's office and saw everything right as he'd been working on it. And the, the, the effect that's had on me as a writer helping me has been incalculable. Um, but at the end of the day, the, just the chance to be part of something that I've loved for so long um, is unparalleled. And I use all these words like, you know, incalculable, unparalleled. I, the, the words can't express it, guys. It's been amazing. Um, and I've been, I'm so honored um, that I have this chance. And I thank you guys all for coming out to see us. We are going to do a Q&A right now. Um, we're going to take questions for the next, oh, 15 minutes or so. 
and just hear what it is you guys want to ask. Uh, go ahead and just shout out, you raise your hands and we'll point it to you. And you shout out your question, it could be for me or for Harriet. Should I avoid spoilers? Yeah, so thank you for saying that. Please avoid spoilers. Let's, let's reiterate this. Last night someone called out a major death in the last book to ask a question about it. Um, when you come up, you can ask spoilers, but don't ask it where others can be. I, I really just want to know, uh, um, these, uh, uh, the outline that you received from Jordan, were all of the uh, deaths in the last book, specifically the major character, um, were those in the outline? Um, there are two major deaths that were not in the outline. One that I chose, and one that Harriet chose. Um, when we were, there wasn't really an outline. We built the outline. There was a list of scenes in the Q&As and, the, the Q &As and things. And a lot of those Q&As focused on where characters ended up. Some of them were ambiguous, um, and we made some judgment calls based on what the, we felt the outline needed. Uh, mo the majority of the deaths were, were told to us. But not every one of them. Okay, right here. Um, was, was there ever a time when you were looking through the notes and preparing to, to start uh, this project where you were like, oh, crap. Like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I, I think I might have bitten off. Because, like, you know, me, 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 you know I, I do some writing, and, and I'm like, you know, getting the task of this. It's like, oh, yeah, this is great. And then, like, n then when everything is done, it's like, oh, no, what did I do? <laughs> Um, there was a point where I looked at The Last Battle, the book of all wars, where I said, oh boy, this is going to be hard. Um, but I had a, a great support structure. Uh, Maria and Alan and Harriet um, really made this possible. Alan's a military historian. He was able to construct a lot of the battle plans for us. Um, Maria is a continuity whiz. And she was able to catch the majority of my stupid mistakes. Not all of them. Um, my stupidity goes beyond Mary's capacity to stop. Uh, but, um, and, then, and then there's Harriet, who um, had edited all of the Wheel of Time books. And um, Harriet's guidance on character voice, you know, was just so useful. Uh, there are times where, you know, I'd write scenes and I'd send them to her and she'd say, this isn't quite right, read this scene. And she would have the scene. She'd say, go read in this book, this scene, and this, there's, you're missing this, this scene, the soul of the characters they express in there, go read that one. Um, and she, uh, other times she'd say, you're spot on here, but you know, this character that they're interacting with is off. Um, I, I, early on, I, I wrote a couple scenes of Avienda, and I sent them in to Harriet, all proud, and Harriet wrote back, her, though we, I met her, so when I flew out, she said, Brandon, you've done an almost perfect Elaine. <laughs> I, I was confused. I mean, Avi wasn't taking a bath, so. <laughs> um, um, and so that's, there were times where I'm like, whoa, but then I had the backup. And so that, that helped a lot. Okay, right here. Um, I have a question. Um, dealing with the um, heroes that are tied to the horn. Is there going to be any future book, you know, um, explaining how they got tied to the horn, how they became heroes? There will, there might be something in the encyclopedia, which Harry can tell you about right now. There will be an encyclopedia of the Wheel of Time. Um, I, my husband and I both signed the contract, and I will tell you the original due date for the encyclopedia was the year 2008. <laughs> but needless to say, the series had not ended by then. By its nature, we have to do a lot of wrap up now that the final book is out, although work on this has progressed ever since the eye of the world. So, um, in very rough form, it's, it's sort of big. I think maybe 31,000 words at the moment. <laughs> yes, 31,000 pages. <laughs> It will take us the rest of 2013 to get it ready to send to New York for illustration and production. And I would say 2014 for a pub date. I'll be waiting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
But in regards to the other question kind of implied there, yeah. regarding other fiction in the Wheel of Time world. The, there will be no other fiction in the Wheel of Time world. The reason for that is that um, Jim had a horror of what he thought of as sharecropping in his universe, then said to prevent it, he would take his hard disks and uh, rent a big uh, a semi and drive back and forth with all the hard disks to be sure that nobody could use them. Um, I respect that absolutely. The, it was, I knew he wanted the series finished, and he did leave enough so that his, um, he once said he was an Old Testament god and his fist was in the middle of his character's lives, um, but his fist would be in the middle of this book. That's not true for anything else that would happen in the Wheel of Time universe. So no other fiction is going to happen. Or as some, some fans said at an earlier signing, well, once copyright runs out, <laughs> I won't be able to do anything about it then. Um, uh, though, to forestall other questions, the Film rights are owned by Universal Pictures, Ooh. and they are developing a feature film based on Eye of the World. Um, okay, there's a question over here, Harriet said. There is in the previous book. If you if you look back, find you'll find it. <laughs> the 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 hair met with an unfortunate incident. <laughs> but please, guys, how many people have not finished the book? Look, look around. This is why no spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> so he did do a good job of talking yes, around it. Yes, he did. <laughs> yep. Please be very careful. Yep. All right. Let's go right here. Uh, getting back to what No. <laughs> he didn't leave anything on them. Okay. All right. Let's go over here. You've raised your hand a bunch of times. Um, the question for Harry, but actually for both of you, because this is really your life's work as well, and it's had an impact, you know, for many of us. This is a twenty-year, fifteen-year journey. What do you think is the real legacy in terms of the impact of Literature, not just sci-fi fantasy, but because this really comes into what's lost. Well, um, on tour this time, we've met, was it seven little aviandas? Yeah. <laughs> some were this big and some were taller. We met a few parents as well. Yes. <laughs> you have a parent? And we met a parent whose younger brother is named Elias. <laughs> <laughs> the couples who say they met because they shared the love of the books. Um, and people, many people have said to me, um, these books have been with me through some very bad times. And I'm so glad the books were there for them. Um, just I think that he has touched lives in a very deep way and very much for the good. I think that's the big legacy. Yeah, the um the at one point somebody said something. Somebody who was cutting the fool, I think, said, So, uh, you brother John, you wrote this series. Um, tell me about it in six words. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim said, Hmm. Cultures crumble, nations fall, cope. 
<laughs> he said, that's only five words, but I don't want to be wordy. <laughs> You know that when I think about the legacy of, of Robert Jordan, I think about things like JordanCon um, and uh, places like Tarvalon.net, um, who do this massive charity work. Um, they've started a foundation called Wingate Foundation. I think of Dragon Mount. Um, I think of all the people these books have brought together. There are a lot of books out there that sell a ton of copies, but how many of them do that? Not very many. I mean, the people who are reading John Grisham novels, John Grisham novels are fine, they're great, but people aren't making charity organizations in the name of John Grisham's characters. Um, the Wheel of Time did something special uh, for the people who read it. Um, and it also changed an entire generation of writers. And I could talk at length about what Robert Jordan has done for my generation. Um, I don't think we have time for that right now, but it that every writer writing in fantasy today basically owes their career to Robert Jordan because him um, popularizing the genre, selling the amount he did, uh, making Tor able to have these big luxurious hardcovers when fantasy was considered ba mostly a paperback genre that, you know, it, with doing this brought um, a lot of revenue to the publisher which the publisher turned around and used to start the careers of lots of new writers. Um, I owe my career to Robert Jordan's success. The tour would not have been able to take a chance on me if Robert Jordan had not been um, as good a writer as he was. Um, and I think that goes for a lot of us in the genre because the other publishers then spent a lot of time playing catch up and had to match what tour was doing. All right, we've got time for maybe, let's see here. Oh, did you want to say something else here? Yeah, mm -hmm. his moral vision, I think, has helped so many people get a good grip on what to do with their own lives. And that, to me, is perhaps his biggest legacy. We've got time for maybe two more. We'll go right here. Um, this is more of a writing question than a wheel of time question. Uh, when you wrote Mistborn and you plotted out the entire trilogy, did you, I know that you, you write between the discovery and the outline writer, did you outline just the main action that's an excellent question. Um, what I do is I think of the pivotal, most important scenes in the books. Um, and these are the scenes that make me, um, they bring emotion to me, the powerful emotions. Um, good emotions and bad emotions, whatever they are, you know. What, what the moments when I'm going to laugh or cry or when I'm going to cheer. Um, and I then say, what needs to happen in the book for these moments to be achieved? And my outline becomes bullet points and lists of things I want to occur in the book in order to achieve these goals. And these moments, um, it, there'll be maybe a dozen of them for a book, because some of them will be smaller, some of them will be more major. Um, and my outline is then all of these steps to reach that goal. And I put these together, and I envision them, and I clump them, and I group them. Um, but there isn't any heading one, subheading B, or things like that. It's all lists of, this needs to happen so I can do this awesome thing. This needs to happen so I can do this awesome thing. This needs to happen so that people will cry. Um, because books are about emotion for me, particularly stories are about emotion. Um, and that's one of the things that I think we do as a genre very well, is we do the emotion. We do the thought, too. The thought is important, but the story is the emotion. All right, let's do way in the back, standing up. Um, wasn't expecting a call on. <laughs> uh, Olivia's scene, did that occur the way that Jordan had written, or was that you? He actually wrote that scene. So it occurred the way he had written it. Um, I won't say anything more to the general audience, but when you come up, I've got a little bit more I can tell you about that, okay? All right, let's do one more, because that was so quick. Um, Right here? Um, I think maybe compared to many other people in the room, I'm relatively new, even though I've uh, listened to most of, if not all, the books. Um, so this question, might, I don't know how, um, it might be a silly question, but ma'am, how, how much influence did you have on him in writing the book? It seems as though, when I was listening, it seems as though it had a very heavy female hand in it. And, <laughs> 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 
say what will happen with the movie ahead of time. Um, it just is. It may not ever be made. Right now, it's in the process leading to what's being made. Um, a heavy female hand. I, <laughs> I would say I have a light finger. <laughs> random, you better. <laughs> You don't have to push it very hard with the scalpel for something to bleed. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, um, at a very early signing, possibly on, probably The Great Hunt, or maybe it was Dragon Reborn, um, but three women in a group came up to him at a signing, and they had on long skirts, and they really were wearing shawls, and I, I was lurking by the front door of the books, bookshop. I just saw them, I didn't hear them. But they went up and said, are you Robert Jordan? And he said, yes, I am. Sitting there with his beard and his 54-inch shoulders and his tweed <laughs> jacket, you know, and his big glasses. They said, huh, well, this settles the bet. And he said, and what bet was that? They said, we were sure that Robert Jordan was the pen name of a woman. <laughs> Because you write women so very well. <laughs> and he also said that um, the women in his family were uh, very strong, and so were the men, because the women killed and ate the weak ones. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't me, that was his birth rat. <laughs> I guess that I, I'm. I guess that's the best I can do. That. <laughs> I understand. That, is, that answers some questions. Harriet, um, before we end, would it be all right if I ask you to do that short reading again? Sure. Um, I need a book. We need a copy of the book. Ooh, first right here. <laughs> well, Harriet's finding this. Um, I thought, before um, I did this story, I thought, if I were in the audience, but, uh, uh, um, I um, I wanted to know what um, what would I want to see if Robert Jordan were still here and he were touring for this book and I thought you know the thing that I would most love to see would be the wind scene be read because it's been the companion through all of these books for us the same same paragraph um, and so I've asked Harriet um, in a lot of these settings to just read this one paragraph. And for you guys, um, this is the closest we can get to having Robert Jordan read it. And so this is just kind of in memory of him. Um, the last time we get to hear this read. The wheel of time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. In one age, called the third age by some, an age yet to come, an age long past, a wind rose in the mountains of mist. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the wheel of time, but it was... A beginning. A beginning.